Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's uh, In Conversation With series. And I'm delighted to be in the company of Jacqueline G. Rogers. I actually feel very honored, Jacqueline, because I've just watched your interview with um, Richie Sunak and your Desert Island Day. So I'm feeling really honored and privileged that you made time for us today. Oh, thank you th so much. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So for everyone joining us on the call, this session will be recorded and available on YouTube. And so if you're not already subscribed to our channels, please make sure you do so. And throughout the session, you have opportunities to put questions to Jacqueline yourself directly, and I'll be reading those out to her. So if she says anything that touches you, or inspires you, um, let us know. And also make sure to connect with her on LinkedIn as well. So Jacqueline, I have always been inspired by you since our paths crossed, I think sometime in 2016. And you, you forged such a beautiful, inspiring, authentic career and brand for yourself. So for those listening who may not already know you, I just wanted to give for you to introduce you, yourself very briefly. Just tell them what you're all about. So first and foremost, I would say um, I'm a woman in tech uh, and I have forged a career in technology always. I would describe myself as more of a tapas girl than a full English. Um, and the reason I would say that is because I don't just have one job, I have a series of jobs. So I wear many different hats and I sit on a few different boards, but I love the in and out of that. I love the project nature of being a big advocate for diversity and inclusion alongside all of that. So that's what I do. Fabulous. And you, and you created this portfolio of career yourself. When did you decide that you needed something different and you needed to create it effectively? Yeah. So it's really interesting you said our paths crossed in 2016 because that was kind of the time um, when I thought, do I want to be working for one single employer full time or do I want to do different roles at the same time. And so I found myself on um, on the lookout for a board position. I had already chaired, um, not chaired, I'd already been part of the um, board of the Prince's Trust, the technology uh, side of that. And I think when you, when you become part of a charity board first, it gives you that board experience. Yeah. And so I went to look for a board of my own and I joined the board of Home Retail Group, which was uh, which owned Argos and Habitat and Homebase at the time. So that was uh, a sector that I thought we could bring a lot of technology expertise to. And so that was my first board. And after that, I joined several others. I'm on the board of Rightmove, uh, yeah. if you know that. And I'm on the board <laughs> of uh, Costain. So Rightmove, it's property all day long. Who doesn't I, love to dream? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. And Costain is all about the nation's infrastructure. So building, you know, railways and bridges and smart motorways, um, enabling innovation and technology to come to construction and infrastructure as well, because smart cities is a really important thing. And I'm on the board of FDM, which is all about technology skills, which is, again, something I'm really focused on so that we don't create a digital divide, we don't leave anyone behind, and we have a skills gap, so we really need to fill that. So so someone listening on this call will be thinking, how does one come to sit on the board of such big PLCs? I know you mentioned at the start that you started with charities, but how did you make that transition from a, a charity chair to sitting on the board of a PLC? Yeah, so it's really interesting, isn't it? I, I, I think it's a number of different things. Number one, I was a, um, a technology executive. Uh, so I was I was a, in a leadership position in a technology company, and then I became um, I, I joined the board of the charity, the Prince's Trust. So I think the combination of that, and also freeing up some time to give to the boards, also matters. I'm going to say one other thing, which is your network really matters because. Yeah. Yeah. 
understanding where these roles are, getting your brand out there so that you're known for leadership, for technology, for advocating for diversity and inclusion. These are all things that boards really care about these days, along with actually, you know, people who are passionate and uh, competent on the climate change area. That's another um, string to your bow if you can bring that to the party when you're looking at board positions. All very important. And of course, diversity really matters. So yes. it's, a, it's a good time to be a girl. And it's well, the course of the pandemic. So we can't meet in person anymore. And it's likely that getting into those power networks is going to be ever more challenging. How would you advise someone to navigate that now? How can we build a network starting now in this um, pandemic world? Yeah, it's a tricky one. I'm, I'm not going to say that's easy because we're so used to bumping into each other on the circuit you know you go to networking events and you meet people but having said that you really only met a handful of people really and sometimes we you know huddled together for warmth didn't we and we really didn't meet so many new people we just said oh Griselda <laughs> thank god you're here how nice <laughs> right um so I actually think networking online is is quite good it's it's quite democratized actually you know your voice is equal online and I think there's a lot of people with a lot of time in their hands in this pandemic and so it has been easier to get to people that certainly I wouldn't have spoken to before and I think that has has helped you do need a degree of courage to reach out to someone because rejection or silence is is you know is the same as it would be physically but you know it depends you've also got to find how people respond so not everybody responds to the same method of communication that you're yes. using so you know we might commute uh, communicate on linkedin messages or on whatsapp or yes. you know email it's not instagram. the same for everybody instagram right so twitter i get i get probably every single route people come at me and it's their preferred route usually mm, um yes. i'm so hyper vigilant i and I'm fear, fear of missing out. I scan them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not missing out on anything, Jack. No, I know. <laughs> so one of my biggest um, characteristics is resilience. And that came because, you know, I grew up in quite a compromised family. Um, y you know, I, there was no money, violent father with a gambling habit. You know, my mother had a black eye every week um, mixed race family in those days there was a real shame around free school dinners because you had to put your hand up if you had free school dinners in class I mean it was it was really tricky um, and as a consequence I think I spent my childhood trying to be quite invisible um, yeah. I felt guilty I couldn't protect my mum and I think you know when I grew up and my mum remarried my stepfather, he was way too interested in me and not in a fatherly way. So that was all really contributed to me being a survivor, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're a survivor, you kind of create a world for yourself where you think, right, OK, put me in a corner and I'm at my absolute best because yeah. there isn't anything worse that you can throw at me. Yeah, um, yeah. I honestly believe that I, I spent my life from the age of 16, I think, showing my stepfather and my mother how much potential I could unlock. And that was deliberate. And I think when you're resilient, you you take control. Um, and I'm going to say as well, during my journey, I was quite an alpha leader. Um, alpha manager, I'm going to call it, because I crossed the chasm from manager to leader when I realized that command and control as an approach wasn't necessarily <laughs> the best way to get, you know, the, the, the highest potential out of my team. So I made a conscious decision at that point to be curiosity led. It's not that I wasn't yeah. kind, actually, but I was tough and I was I had the best ideas in the room. I, I was, you know, 20 miles ahead of everyone else. But that didn't give people space to be amazing. Yeah. Yes. And I really needed to do that. So that was a big lesson. And I started to get more easily promoted after that, actually, that better relationships. And other people felt able to share their stories. And 
you know, you create that one plus one equals 11 kind of culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So nice. So, so I, I find that when I speak to women who have thrived in male-dominated spaces, they tend to embody um, personalities and characteristics that are typical of alpha men. Um, and we lose ourselves in that process. But when I've met you, you've not come across in that way at all. Yeah. You're a very authentic, feminine, energy-led kind of leader. Um, and I know you've just said that you had you made that switch somewhere in your career. How did you feel more comfortable being you? Because I think some people get so lost in the journey. Um, yeah. They're trying to be so many people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that they don't know who they are. Yeah. And it's a really good question because I it was it was a point in time and I remember it was in 1999 and I was up for a promotion against a male colleague and I didn't get it and he had you know very little experience very little responsibility I I had honestly 30 times more experience than he had and they promoted him not me and I asked the, for feedback and they said well Jacqueline we simply don't put women on the leadership team and I looked at that feedback and of course that you know it felt like the door had really slammed in my face you know for someone to say we don't put women on the leadership team that's I just know. like wow well, <laughs> however i also then reflected on so what else could i do where's the miracle in this and the miracle i think there were a number of miracles one at least he told me because yes. you know if he hadn't i would have been banging my head against the glass ceiling for another five years the lesson for me there was be yourself because you know, everybody else is taken anyway. So, you know, just just take up the best of your own capability. You know, I think then I lacked the authenticity and the value system that now informs everything I do. You know, I, I have three values, which are family, generosity and integrity. But I only learned that about myself after I didn't get that job. And what I learned was if you if you trust your values, under pressure they always show up yes always yes and so i guess life is a lot simpler when you're being your authentic self because yes. under pressure you show up anyway like yes. that and so i think just being me felt like a relief and a release yes. but it took not getting that job to get there right so it was a bit of a self-reflection period of self-reflection actually so you turn something that would typically be a, 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 a sad story and end to the beginning of something beautiful. And I think that's a lesson we can all learn. Um, you've touched on your childhood, which sounds really ch challenging. Um, yet you have managed to, again, turn that into a positive. And I know I meet so many people in my work who seem to have challenges that look very professional. But then when you dig a bit deeper that there is always this childhood influence or trauma that is being carried into the professional yeah so how do you how would you advise someone who you know has a background like that who is really struggling and maybe still attributing their challenges and you know their struggles to some of those experiences yeah i mean i'm a great believer and there's no no such thing as failure there's only success or learning and and yeah. i think as a survivor one of the i learn from it and what was my responsibility and accountability in that moment of not winning and i think there is always two there are two forces in in a in a moment aren't there there's there's your the part that you play and then there's and there's the part that other people play and you can decide what happens to you is either within or without your control. And I choose the piece that I can control is the piece, how I feel, how I'm impacted, how I'm yes. going to learn from that going forward. That that gave me as a control freak, frankly, <laughs> something to, to grasp to, work, and with. to yeah. work with. And it really served me well, you know, because I don't want to blame anybody or yeah. anything for what happens to my life. I'd like yeah. to think that even if it's not perfect, in some way, at some level, I chose it. Yeah. And that, that is 
you know, that's useful for me to reframe as a learning or as a, a, a celebration of some some kind. And and yeah, I choose not to drag baggage around with me. That's also true. I, I love that. I choose not to drag baggage around with me. That's a tweetable. Thank you so much. <laughs> be, be, because I, I have the same mindset. Life can be so challenging. I think sometimes we think life is supposed to be roses, but it can't be, it isn't. Even amongst roses, we have thorns. So you have days where it's brilliant and you feel alive and everything seems to be working. And then you have days where you can't seem to do the right thing. Yeah. And it's really managing, learning to take the, the low days to the high days and, and staying, feeling like you still have some control over what happened to you ultimately. I think that's right. And also, you, I don't know if you can have the highs unless you have a little bit of lows, can you? How do you appreciate that? And, you know, I, I really think enjoy the journey. It's not always about getting there. It's not always about arriving, is it? It's about getting there as well. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think there are some thorny times and they are usually there for a reason. Right. There's so much uncertainty and people are bent out. And so you've been through this. We had an earlier conversation and we, we both thrived in the pandemic for various reasons. But for those who have struggled, um, what advice do you have for, for picking yourself back up and just finding a way to keep showing up and keep putting one foot in front of the other? You seem to, have, to, to do that really well. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I am one of those that have thrived during the pandemic, but you know, I'm not, I'm not um, going to deny that I am in a privileged position because I have a garden and I have yes. a puppy and I have a husband who's a yoga and meditation teacher. I have space. Oh wow! <laughs> right. So all of those things, you know, make for pretty, you know, wonderful existence, and that's not the same for everybody. So first of all, let's recognise that. But there are some coping strategies that um, that I think are useful. One is, I don't think meetings always need to be for an hour. Uh, yes. Why do we do that? So <laughs> for time management, let's call it that. Let's schedule. I mean, 15 to 20 minutes is perfectly fine. And do you know what? When you give someone 15 to 20 minutes of your time, generally they'll start talking about the thing they really need to talk about Look straight about. away rather than all the preamble stuff. So I think if you want to buy yourself back some time to walk around, to yeah. just meditate for 10 minutes on your yeah. car map or whatever app you're using, um, or your husband kindly comes in <laughs> to do a meditation <laughs> session for you. But I think, you know, I, I do think that creating the space is the first yes. thing. The second thing I would say is, you know, honoring the body greens <laughs> but you know you also feel better when you've done you know whatever thousand steps you need to do a day and 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 i think health and well-being is really important and also connect with people who bring you joy yes yes you know yes, yes. It, that's really important and maybe you know i have learned that generosity and giving your time to something can sometimes make you feel so fulfilled rather than wondering, you know, I think the whole, what people are gonna do for you is one thing, but when you start giving in the other direction, it, that generosity, you know, chemical that goes off in your brain is just makes you feel so good. Yes. And I did a lot of that in the pandemic and I, you know, it, it works, it helps. It does, it does. Because sometimes you don't show up for yourself but you will show up for somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Oh, we, we've got Crystal just say, it's so lovely to hear you speak about your journey. She feels like she's going through the same thing as well. So thank you so much for sharing that. So Jacqueline, we touched about routine. I, I'm very fascinated about routines at the minute because what I realize is that you find people who show up and they show up so strong um, and they look, they make life look easy, but it's because of the daily practices and the routines that underpin their, their, um, how they show up. So I, I wanted you to share your daily practice with us. When you wake up, what do you do? What does a typical day look like? Yeah. So, okay. So typical day, 
starts with meditation with my husband first thing we don't do anything else don't look at phones nothing wow. so that that's that then my little puppy um archie he needs to go out for a wee at six o'clock without fail otherwise it's world war three down there so <laughs> you know that has to happen so we're out making sure that happens and then we go for a dog walk and wow. then i will look at my day and think okay meetings that started about nine I generally don't start before then because I've got so much life to live before that time. I need to have my breakfast. And then, but I will I always schedule my, I'll schedule my meetings for, you know, for, um, so that I've got breaks, quite a yes. lot of space. So that if yes. I want to overrun, I can. If I, you know, I, I think you need to schedule in the bio breaks because, you know, you need a wee. You just need, you just need to. And I don't know, the blokes, I think blokes, Blokes, we um, women less we, often. Yes. Yeah, they less often, but women take three point one times longer than men. I think it's in it's in the book. I'm going to share with you later. But um, women oh, wow. take longer anyway, so we need a, a little bit longer to just do the do. And and I think that's important. <laughs> so yeah, and I generally finish at about five thirty, something like that. But in between, my puppy is like very demanding, and he's always licking my toes under my desk. Oh my God, I just want to be in your shoes right now. I know, it may, it brings me joy. He brings me joy. Oh, but, but Jacqueline, you make it sound so easy. But, but you know, someone listening on this who probably has a new baby or just navigating middle management or maybe just made a leader for the first time will be thinking, oh, I can't start at nine. I can't take those breaks. I can't stop at 5.30. What do you have to tell this person? Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? I had that when I was running a business, um, and I there was one one um, brilliant uh, woman on the team actually who had a little one, and and she said, "Well, I'm going to leave at three thirty, and I but I'm going to log on later." And but the good thing about working here is, you know, I can work part time. Um, you give me part time salary, so I can do part time. Not okay with me. So as a leader, I think you need to um, walk the talk when you've got people on your team like that. And also, you know, be the role model. So if you leave at whatever time or you take breaks, what it does is it gives other people yes. permission. And so I would say I understand that middle management, it's tough. You know, yes. I'm sitting here with gray hair at the end of my career, having, you know, and I... <laughs> I'm very demanding and I, you know, people don't tell me what to do anymore. But you know what? You are a role model whether you choose to be or not. And frankly, if you as a working mother take that break, other women feel they can too. And yes. so I think it is important for us all to flock together and huddle together for warmth in that regard. Otherwise, how will they know that we, we need, need to, that? Yeah, we need to normalize it. Yeah, we yeah. do. Yeah, and yeah. have the babies, you know, with you. It's all right. It's fine. <laughs> Honestly, we all need a bit of Jacqueline every day. So, so Jacqueline, I know you. It's not been plain sailing. Um, you've had some tough um, appointments as well. And uh, can you talk us through some of those the most challenging appointment you've had, and you know how you made the choice to walk away or stay or. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, you know, LinkedIn is one of those things where your journey always looks like it's it goes up and up and up, and it's all airbrushed and wonderful, isn't it? And and yeah, I mean, I have had appointments that have been short, and and do you know I reframe them as projects and as learning, but you know, sometimes when you're faced with a higher up, a boss who does not share your value set. You know, it crosses a line for me, and you know, I have chemistry. That's one thing, but if it's value based, you know, I think there's a red line for me, and and that's where it is important. Google it, look at, you know, find your values. There yes. is it's very easy to do that exercise online, yes. and and when you find them, you it, it life becomes very clear because every yes. decision you make is informed by them. Yes, yes, we spend a lot of time on our leadership programs as well because. People don't realize that that's why they're feeling so much angst at work. Yeah. Um, it's because sometimes the values are just misaligned 
or we yeah. think they are lying. And you, you need to just bring that to um, your awareness more uh, consciously. And so then in terms of leading people remotely, we've had people starting new jobs in the pandemic. And it's not the same as, you know, having an induction where you're introduced to the whole team and you get to read people's body language and you go out for drinks. It's not the same. So for anyone who's starting a new role in this pandemic, whether they are coaching, um, they're leading teams or they're part of a team, what advice, what suggestions would you have for navigating that now? Yeah, it's not easy because, you know, I suppose our human instincts are all about reading the room, taking the yes. temperature, uh, <laughs> understanding, you know, who you're likely to align with, who you think, um, you know, you could really learn from. It's very difficult, but... I, I go back to perhaps one of my life lessons, which is, you know, questions are your friend here. So I would be constantly curious and ask questions of other people. And I think that way you will, you will, you know, I think it's about being interested or interesting, isn't it? And yes. if you're interested and constantly curious, A, you learn more, and B, I think you forge really good, deep relationships that matter. And that's when you need to do it when you start in the company. So I would say, be curious, use questions. We're on and the sound was on, but as the pandemic has progressed, I'm finding that sometimes, I, and I think maybe people are drained or tired or just fed up of the calls they are not putting on their videos as much. And so for anyone who is, you know, just drained from all this, what advice? Do you have any things to share? Well, first, firstly, I would not have back-to-back -back Zooms all day long. So I agree, you know, take a break from, from the intensity. Yes. Uh, choose the meetings where you need to be there with intention, though. I have these blue screen glasses, which are clear lenses, but they, they stop the sort of screen burn and that really helps a lot physically. I would also say, you know, have a Zoom meeting, but also remember, we remember the phone call. Do you remember yes. that? You know, just have a phone call with someone whilst you're doing something else. Cause that's, you know, we're so multitasking as people that I think, you know, it's all right to, to do that. We've forgotten the, the phone call. I <laughs> think we need yes. to build that in. We need to bring the phone calls back in. Yeah. So if you have any questions for Jacqueline, please feel free to type them in now. Um, and then I can I can read them to her as we go through the interview. Um, Jacqueline, do you have, I know you've had, a, your, your family is much older now. And I also know that you have elderly uh, mom. Your mom is elderly. My mom has dementia. Um, I think your mom has dementia as well. Yeah. And um, it's really challenging navigating, juggling these two responsibilities. Um, how have you done that? I think yeah. I saw a post you put something on Instagram about your mom and I was really yeah. touched because I, I really f understood what you were going through. Yeah, dementia is so cruel, isn't it? Because it, she actually, my mom is absolutely fine. She thinks she works and I mourn who she is now versus who she was, what? but she's fine. The staff are wonderful to her and she's still making a contribution to her environment and all the people with her. So, you know, that's, you can't really ask for anything else. I tell you what was really sad was my stepfather died when, um, in January. And so she didn't go to the funeral We and the staff said not to tell her. And so, and she actually doesn't, she, she doesn't think she's married anymore anyway. So it's just, right. It's just, so wow. it was, but, you know, delivering the eulogy at my yeah, yeah. father's funeral was tricky because you're sort of delivering it for her as well. But she yes. wasn't, there, wasn't able to be there. It's, it's hard. It's a hard time, I think. Yeah. And of course, I can't see her yet. I'm still we're still behind Perspex. So we're oh, not wow. in. Person. Yeah. So it's all very arm's length. I, I find understand why I can't jump out of the phone when we oh, face. I find it really difficult when I see my mom because she was the strongest woman. I mean, if you've ever heard me talk about my mom, she was strength, you know, personified. And I found that 
because knowing what she's gone through and the stresses she's had to deal with and potentially how that may have triggered um, her illness in old age, I'm very conscious about stress and managing my life a lot better. And, and there are stages in life that seem to be a lot more stressful than others. Um, I, and you've again talked about your yoga practice and walks and all that. But what else you do to manage stress and to keep your, your mind and your body in tip top shape as, as we progress through the different chapters of our lives? Yeah. And I mean, so a couple of things. One on dementia, I think because my mother was the victim of domestic violence, which was so terrible, I think blows to the head are oh. not nothing, right? So I think mm -hmm. I, I, my suspicion, I don't know, but I imagine that's contributing. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of keeping sane and healthy, definitely yeah. meditation is, is my rock. I don't do it for a long time, so I'm not going to pretend to the listeners that I do it for, <laughs> you know, 10 days or, or, or three hours, it, you know, some days it's 10 minutes and that's enough to just press the reset button. The other thing is I only say yes to things that bring me joy. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you for saying yes to this. <laughs> you bring me joy, Griselda. You bring me joy. Um, so I will only do things that bring me joy and, yes. and where I feel I'm contributing. So, it doesn't feel like a drain I'm called Margaret Heffernan, who's a brilliant author, brilliant mentor and brilliant advocate for the NHS. She's a brilliant speaker as well. She's done TED Talks. But she her rule is she will speak um, on the speaker circuit, but only for free if it's on behalf of the NHS, as an example. Oh, so that's wow. her rule. Yeah. If anyone else asks her for free, no, because that's yeah. where she gives her time. And I think it's, it's could it's and what that says is whatever you your boundaries are, yes, you just need to know what they are. So maybe there's an exercise um, in development around what are your boundaries? Jeez, yes. And actually, leadership lesson. The leadership lesson of the moment is what am I going to do less of, not yes. what am I going to do more of. And I think once you answer that question, once you figure out your boundaries, life gets a whole lot easier. It does. It does. I think I had this revelation over the pandemic that um, I didn't need to do everything. Yeah. And I, I, I'm never really truly free because there's always my family to spend time with. Um, and yeah. so a anything that I commit to is taken away from their time. Yeah. Um, so unless it's contributed in some way to their future, I'm not going to give up that free time that I have with my children. And since I, I made, because over the pandemic, there was no free time. It was either you're with the children, trying to homeschool them, or you're trying to work. And it's, you know, I'm still applying that rule now. When people approach me, I just say, you know, I'm, I'm not available. If I want to do it, and it's aligned with all, you know, the exciting things I want to be involved in, then it's easier to say yes. But otherwise, I found it easier and easier to say no. And, and you value your own time. Every time you say yes to somebody else, you're saying no to yourself. Just remember that. Brilliant. Wow. So we like to end off with a book recommendation. Um, so what book would you recommend to the readers, to the listeners? Oh, I've got more than out. one. I've got more than yes, one. But... Yes, yes, yes. Okay, 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 okay. So um, I wasn't, um, so this is my book oh, recommendation. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So if, you yes. Yeah. So if you haven't, yes. If you haven't read Invisible Women, um, you must, must read this. It's so interesting. It's about um, the data bias that we live with. Yes, yes. Um, you know, uh, it's so just revealing for example medicines are tested on mice male mice mm. so that means that dosages for women in prescriptions are way too high oh wow it's an example of of bias so it exposes yes. data bias so the world is designed for men and it is. it's not it's not um it's very factual it's very full it will take you a while it's a bit like a reference book yes so, I mean, uh, I would definitely recommend that. Second book, I would say, is How to Talk to Robots. Because I'm oh, a woman wow. in tech, 
Um, it's about how uh, we get our girls into tech and how we talk to robots. So it's by Tabitha Goldstab, who's amazing AI um, advocate and expert. So it makes the case that women should be central to the development of AI, artificial intelligence. So I think that's number number two. And number three, since um, Rory Kethlin Jones is the technology uh, uh, correspondent um, on the BBC, and he's talking all about um, the uh, smartphone era and also how it's impacted us during the pandemic. So scheduling in the, the wee breaks and all that, it's been fantastic <laughs> listening to you and learning from you. So if you're listening to me and um, you missed the live recording of this session, you can register on our website, our Forward Ladies, What's On, and you can join me for the next uh, inspirational interview. And if you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify or YouTube, we'll love for you to subscribe and to share it with your network. Um, as you can see, it's fantastic gems shared um, in this interview and in the previous ones we've done as well. And last but not least, this in conversation with is brought to you um as a result of the forwardladies.com community it's an amazing online community of women globally and um, we celebrate leaders we train them we support each other so if you're not already a member please consider joining us it's only the price of an amazon prime subscription and you get a lot more out of this membership then you will get out of that membership. So thank you so much for joining us and connect with us on Instagram, on Twitter and LinkedIn.